So what does implementation look like from a technical readiness perspective? Well, the first thing we have to understand is that there are more shared activities in this space. When we think about implementation plans, we need to work with the business. So in the very beginning of the session, I talked about the importance of understanding the scenarios that are impacted by Copilot. So you have to take those scenarios and map out when do you expect them to be impacted and how are you going to measure or drive that kind of optimization on impact. And this is what most of the time we mean by AI transformation roadmaps or shared implementation plans. We're thinking of who owns the check-in, not necessarily who's driving that change, just accountability for checking in on that. And then we essentially structure this over a few different key scenarios. So this can be really helpful and I do encourage this type of technique, but I think it's a little bit more complex than this. So I wanna talk a little bit more about the implementation plan. Again, this will be something we talk about it from a different perspective on the business side, but from a technical perspective, we're really thinking about licensing, we're thinking about data security uh, dependencies, we're thinking about um, things like uh, governance and optimization. Uh, those are things that we're thinking about from a, a technical team perspective as we look at the roadmap. The roadmap is generally created by the business and then IT is kind of saying, well, you know, based on our experience and our understanding, this is a better timeline or this is more re you know, reasonable. So there's a lot of like, um, you know, complexity is trying to driven by IT and then, you know, interest and value is driven by the business. That's probably the best way to frame it. All right. So let's think about that timeline. Generally speaking, uh, we've done a lot of these. So over 100 customers we've helped with AI transformations, Copilot, et cetera. In that time, what we found is that the first four to eight weeks is really critical for technical readiness. So you're going to have a lot of high intensity work in those four to eight weeks. But once you complete those four to eight weeks, it really does shift to a proactive, um, you know, proactive programmatic style of approach where you're more looking at data and systems and you're approaching it kind of in the way that you've always been doing it, uh, hopefully even a, in a better way uh, using uh, scaled approaches with Copilot. So, so that's what's going to happen in the later parts. But those first uh, four to eight weeks are quite intense. The other thing to understand is that there are some dependencies here. So I've highlighted in bold some of the things that I find uh, people might underestimate on the technical readiness side. So help desk onboarding is something that we really encourage in the first few weeks. Um, again, remember, those are the first users we often encourage, like POC, if you don't want to call it a pilot, you give them licensing for co-pilot capabilities, because um, generally speaking, they use a lot of resources and already have pretty good security posture set up around them. Uh, another key thing here is that implementation plan, um, the shared implementation plan we're kind of talking about now, should be defined really early on. The reason that's really important is so everyone kind of has one idea of how to approach this, and then you refine it, you know, week over week, month over month as you continue your work. But doing uh, an early stage of that implementation plan is always better. I really, we've seen a direct result where customers who do that planning early and get that in place uh, at an earlier time do tend to have higher success and their projects tend to be better for timing. Um, the other thing is we've already talked about data security controls and installing apps and assigning licenses. Uh, again, I would encourage that to be done even earlier in the first one or two weeks, like very, very quick. So that again, help desk onboarding and other things are dependent on those. And then later, as we talk about support systems, understand that the way AI works in an organization is the more users start to use these tools, the more their expectations increase. And as those expectations increase, people want to see you know, faster response times and more. So this is going to have a direct impact on you know, your um, model for service support. Uh, and we'll talk about service health reviews and some of these other things in a little bit. All right, so that's the first thing, sense of timeline. Now, I like to overshare. So instead of just looking at this one 12-week uh, timeline, I wanna give you a couple other ideas. One of the other things we can do is we can look at how we deliver this generally from a standard approach. So of course, every customer is a little unique, but generally speaking, we have two types of uh, offers or approaches, a co-pilot readiness accelerator, and then a pilot program. I'm not trying to sell you on these offers. I'm just trying to explain the context. So the, the first one for the readiness accelerator timeline is around four weeks on average. And um, we actually find longer than this isn't often needed, where you're essentially trying to do overviews, a lot of education in the first week, then you do technical and business readiness because you need that education often as a prerequisite to review a lot of the findings together. Then you do data and security, technical planning. And remember, plugins and extensibility happens typically in weeks two or three. It's very early uh, as we explore and understand that. Then you have, we call it an AI backlog, but it's really helpful to think of this backlog that's generated. Well, 
all sorts of different demands and requirements and needs. When we define that backlog, we can then use that as a way to you know measure what needs to be changed, what needs to be optimized over you know many months uh, and and program cycles moving forward. So I really do encourage the backlog model. It works really well, um, and that has been a differentiator for some of our customers who've invested in backlogs and managed to maintain them versus those that didn't. We definitely see a higher ROI and uh, efficacy on those that use backlogs. Um, the other big one is reviewing feedback. So even in this early stage, because you've hopefully enabled it for a subset of users, you still wanna gather data and feedback and early learnings. Um, that'll be really important because it'll help us plan that next stage pilot planning and, and the backlog itself, optimizing and remediating that backlog. So these are a different way to look at it. Instead of like a 12 week timeline, a more concentrated what a four week timeline looks like, uh, maybe with outside support, whether it's two lead, you know, you pick your favorite vendor. Um, I do encourage doing this with friends. And so this is one way you could approach that. Uh, and then I have a work breakdown example here and then some samples on what I mean by backlog on the right. Again, just to look at it in the slides yourself as well as some deeper language. If we look at a pilot plan, uh, it could also change a little bit. So here's an example of a pilot plan. You'll see it's around 12 weeks because the last four weeks is when you're actually starting a scaled pilot. Again, typically like 50, 100 users, whatever it is. At that 12 week uh, mark, we started to really do that. And then we're doing check-ins typically on a monthly basis to really understand how that pilot's going. So. Uh, we we phase pilots or we do other types of uh, models around uh, rolling pilots is really what you want to think about, not individualized project pilots. That doesn't work with Copilot. It's an exponential curve. Uh, remember, we talked about teams and team-based nomination. Demand's going to increase, so you need to bridge that gap, and you know, rolling pilot is a better model. Uh, the only other thing to note here is um, I've highlighted some of the business dependencies in this visual, but it kind of gives you a sense of how that timeline might flow. Again, I'm just trying to give you guys a reference material, both in the slides and the recording that you can use uh, in a complement instead of having to like do this all with just like the Microsoft standard material. All right. So again, just like before, um, there's also this opportunity then to align this uh, Copilot program with broader AI roadmaps. Um, I do encourage that. Remember, Copilot for Microsoft 365 is one of many, 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 many AI investments you're making it as an organization. So it's really helpful to think about your own AI planning and strategy, whether it's Viva or other workloads, and then align those things together in you know various roadmaps and visualizations. So um, this is just like a you know quick reference um, in the business talk. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but that becomes really important for technical readiness as well. All right. So let's say you build that shared implementation plan. Then what's next? Well, what's next is often understanding your service management plan and how that changes. When you take something like Copilot for Microsoft 365, the way you manage it as a service is going to be future focused. It's going to be based on modern service management approaches. And we do find just like the technical debt issue that I mentioned earlier in security debt, we find that a lot of customers have governance and service management debt that they haven't paid uh, especially since the pandemic. Uh, they've been very reactive, fighting fires. And so now you kind of, uh, at least for around Copilot, you want to start scaffolding improved service health designs and service management designs. Now, there's some Microsoft material here that's a good starting point, but I do really want to think about this from a, a health review perspective. So what I, we often encourage is in those first few weeks when we're planning and preparing, um, we're doing all that security stuff, we also look at how we're managing the service and um, you know how the service health, and when I say service, I'm saying things like what Microsoft 365 represents. So for some customers, that might be called like digital collaboration services, right? And so you're looking at your digital collaboration services and you're saying, this is how it's changing in the uh, post-generative AI era, right? So these are the things that we need to think about. How does sourcing change or how does the function or change management change? Well, change management is drastically different in an exponential curve versus linear technology, right? So the way um, Microsoft 365 will work now is it's not a linear technology progression path where you get updates in the message center and you just adapt and so on and so forth. You're gonna see an exponential curve there um, because of the impact AI is having across all the stack, not just Copilot for Microsoft 365. So it's really important to re-evaluate your service model design now so you're ready for 2025 and beyond. Um, so that's basically what I'm saying here is that this effort, again, you can, you can isolate it for cost modeling and other things, but this effort does happen and there's a lot of um, things you can learn around governance and other things like that through your deployment of Copilot for Microsoft 365. So again, our carrot 
we've used this carrot of Copilot already for technical debt and security debt. Then we've used it for um, you know migration and modernization, consolidation, and now we're using it for governance uh, debt, arguably that happens today. And so that's really exciting that you can use it for all these things because the return on investment is so high. We have found this is one of the best budget breakers ever in terms of opening up opportunity to actually solve, at least make meaningful strides in a lot of these categories that are harder to fund. 